My job right. Um, so now we'll do a little bit of parallel play with the random intercept model. Um, so suppose, for example, that we want to look at the effects of ego and alter gender on the number of support functions provided by an alter to an ego, right? So how does my gender and the gender of my alter affect how much support I'm getting from them? What's your hypothesis? So we're not measuring yet homophily, right? Um, now we're just measuring like what do dudes do and what do women do? Women provide more support. I think that's probably right. Who do you think gets more support, men or women? We're mixed. We're mixed. Okay, well we'll just have to see because honestly I don't remember that part. <laughs> Okay, so here's my regression function for this, right? So I have um, my overall intercept, I have the beta for alter gender, uh, and then whether that alter is male or female, I have a beta for ego gender, and ego's actual gender, I have my random intercept, and then my error term. Um, and the outcome here is number of support functions. Okay, so I run my model, I called it model six. Um, let's see. So the important sort of things that you'll need to know about here is that you always want to specify Rummel. So this is a, a particular way of computing multi-level models that relaxes an assumption that is always violated pretty much. And that is the assumption that the random intercept is correlated with the uh, random coefficient, which will make more sense in like five slides. Um, but it doesn't hurt you or change anything if you don't need it. Right, so just always do Rummel forever and ever and ever. Um, okay, so here's your output. It outputs AIC and BIC, log likelihood. And you're gonna see different parts of the model. So you're gonna see the random effects, right, which in this case is just the random intercept. And then you're gonna see the fixed effects, which is the betas that we're all used to uh, interpreting and being interested in, right? So right here, we have the standard deviation of the random intercepts. So this basically tells us how far apart are people on average? If the standard deviation is big, then the random intercepts within that sample are very different, right? If it's small, then not so much. This is the standard deviation of the residuals, which you would also get from an OLS model. And this just tells you how far apart are the observations, in this case, from the random intercept. So here we can see that the variation within is bigger than the variation between, right? That's what this is telling us. So in other words, people's own alters are more different from each other on average uh, than, the, than the egos are from each other. So there must be something about that dyad or about that alter that has a big effect on the support given, right? Okay. Um, we can reduce these or change these by adding stuff to the model, right? Because when we're adding in predictors, it's not error anymore, right? That information is going to the means, right, or the fixed effects. So sometimes one thing that's interesting is looking at how these change as you're adding level one and level two variables, right? You're sort of explaining away some of that unexplained stuff. Okay, so down here we have the fixed effects. So this is our y-intercept, our overall intercept, that's based on a weighted average of all of the random intercepts, right? Remember, it's not based on the observations anymore. It's based on the, the random intercepts. Um, so that's important. Um, and then down here, we have the um, distribution of the residuals, right? So this tells us um, about those error terms and how they're distributed. This is a null model, right? So there's nothing in here. So it's always good to start with a null model, meaning there's no independent variables, because that tells you about sort of your baseline level of variation at the different levels, right? So what am I dealing with in terms of dependency? How much is there? Is it more, uh, do we see more variation within or more variation between? And then we can check and see how this changes as we add variables to the model, okay? Um, 
we usually prefer to report the variance rather than the standard deviation of random components, and we need the variance anyway to calculate the interclass correlation, which is that really nice interpretable sort of correlation of observations within, right? So we can get that in R uh, this way, right? And then we can just calculate this here is our variance between level two egos, and this is our variation within level two egos, right? And we can use that information then to calculate our interclass correlation. And so we showed you this formula before, right? It's within, or sorry, between over between plus within. And so our interclass correlation here is about 0.06. So we can interpret this in terms of magnitude in the same way that we would interpret um, an R, right? So it's a low correlation. So there's low correlation of alters within egos, which makes sense, right, when we're looking here at these differences. So all this information is sort of telling us the same thing. But the ICC is typically what you would report in a paper for the model, for example. Okay, so now I've added some predictors here. I've added uh, ego gender and alter gender, so just two variables. And so again, we have our random effects and our fixed effects. So if we're interested in interpretation here, this is the effect of ego gender, and this is our beta, right, and our p-value. So this tells me that ego being a woman does not have any effect on how much support she gets, right, which is probably why I forgot. Uh, this is the effect of alter being a woman, and we can see here that when an alter is a woman, the ego gets more support, which is what was predicted, right, and that's a significant. Uh, significant finding. And so you can see that the things we care about, other than the ICC, and looking at the, the variation within and between, we interpret this the exact same way that we normally would, right? So there's nothing sort of flashy uh, or interesting or problematic about this. Um, okay. All right. So one of the things that we need to be really careful about in doing multi-level modeling is cluster confounding or what we could also call contextual effects. So the random intercept or random um, effects model assumes that the level one covariates are not correlated with your random intercept, right? So these things are supposed to be uncorrelated. So the errors are supposed to be uncorrelated with the intercept. But this is problematic because every level one variable varies both within and between clusters, right? So put another way, all these level one alter variables are containing information about both alters and about networks. So for every additional woman I have in the network, that tells me something about her gender, but it also tells me something about the gender composition of the network, right? So alters education tells me something not only about their own education, that alters education, but also the amount of social capital available in the network as a whole, right? So it's really important to try to disaggregate those two effects, the alter level effects, from the sort of uh, effect of that person's attributes going to or contributing to the overall network effect, right? So we can't assume always that a variable like gender or like uh, economic status has the same effect at the alter and the network level, right? At times, and in its extreme form, they can actually have opposite effects, right? So for example, uh, alter being a woman could have a different effect from being in a network that's composed largely of women, right? Okay. So in ego networks, we call this contextual effects. Um, and, and there's, you can separate the variation. There are other ways to do this if you have other kinds of multi-level models. But for ego network research, it really makes sense to do it this way. Um, and that's a contextual effect. So all you do to do this is include the aggregated network version of that alter variable in the model, right? So if we have alter gender in the model, we also want the gender composition of the network in the model. Then we're explicitly separating those two effects, right? Um, if I have alter closeness, I also want the cluster mean or the network mean closeness or the average closeness across the alters in the model at the same time, right? And this is called the contextual effect because you can test whether the network level has any significant effect on your outcome over and above the alter or tie level, which 
actually maps on really nicely to what we care about theoretically in ego network research, right? So does the network have some effect independent of that dyad, right? Or of what's happening at that dyadic level, right? Is the network more than the sum of its parts, a la Barry Wellman, right? Which is something that's theoretically very interesting, which is why it makes sense to use uh, this strategy both for dealing with cluster confounding, but also because it can tell you, it can pro provide rich theoretical information. Okay. So we're going to do the same thing. You, you maybe have already run all the models in that file, um, but the next one adds a contextual effect in R, right? So in this case, going back to the same um, example that we were using before, it could be that being in a network full of women affects how much support each individual altar provides over and above their own altar gender, right? Over and above their own gender. So the way you do this is you first create a contextual or aggregated network variable using the AVE command. And this is something like these set of tools in R are going to be really useful for you if you want to create these aggregated variables, even if you're using just standard regression, right? So you want to pay attention to average. Uh, the function over here is the mean, but you can use other functions like maximum or minimum or standard deviation uh, to get um, other sort of forms, right, of these variables. But typically for a contextual effect, we just want to use the, the average, right? So we created this as a new variable. Uh, the new variable is called netfem, and I'm going to change this, um, change the, the form of the variable, because if I don't do this, then a one unit change is from zero to one, which means going from no women to all women in your network. Uh, so the coefficient's going to look really big and the interpretation's going to be weird. So basically I'm just going to change it so that a one unit effect is a 10% increase, right, in uh, the proportion of women in the network. Okay. So then I run my model. And so what I've done now is I have ego gender, alter gender, and then the proportion of women in the network in tens, right? And so if I look down here, Ego gender, still not significant. Alter gender becomes stronger. The effect of alter gender becomes slightly stronger, right? And the effect of network gender, right, or the proportion of women in the network actually has the opposite effect. So if the alter is a woman, that is associated with an increase in the number of support functions that person provides, all else equal. But if that same alter is embedded in a network, that has a higher proportion of women, they're less likely to provide support, and that's significant. So this is a situation where the network level effect and the alter level effect are in opposite directions and both significant. And this actually happens more than you would think, right? So by taking this out, this type of variation out at the network level, then I have the true effect of alter gender, right? That's not conflated with any information that that contributes to the network characteristics. Right? So why do you think that being in a network with lots of women uh, would be associated with less support at the altar level? More people, more people on the network. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You assume that everybody else is doing it, or maybe other people really are doing it, right? And so you yourself can do less. Yep, exactly. Perfect. Okay. So is everybody relatively comfortable with this as much as you can be in a three-hour workshop? Yeah? OK, because I do want to teach you about the random coefficient model, which is way cooler um, and is, is also not difficult, right? So the random coefficient model, just like random intercept, was an easy extension from OLS. This is just an easy extension from the random intercept model. We're just breaking up piles of variance. So the random intercept model is based on the premise that every level two ego needs its own random intercept to account for the dependency of level one alters within networks, right? But in that model, the effects of any independent variable or the slopes, right, are parallel. All the level two clusters are assumed to be equal in terms of the effect of any independent variable on an, an outcome, right? So we can see different intercepts but we're not going to allow the effect of some variable to differ across clusters or across egos, 
But of course, there might be situations where a variable means more, has a bigger effect in a particular network than it does in another. And for that, we need a random coefficient model. So here's just an example. Here's Jane and Joe again uh, with their sexy time. And you can see that here we have the random intercept difference, right? And so Joe is below. He has less sex on average. Jane has more sex on average. But what this is telling us is that in Joe's network, the quality of communication has no impact on how much sex he's having with his partners, right? Apparently, I don't know, he doesn't care about talking to his sex partners, and that's fine. Um, he's a Neanderthal, I'm not sure. Uh, but up here, you can see that for Jane, and maybe this is a gender effect, the quality of communication matters a lot for how much sex she's having with her partners, right? And so we shouldn't then constrain these lines to be parallel. We shouldn't constrain the slopes to be equal. So we can do that by adding a random coefficient or allowing every level two observation's slope to differ as well as its intercept. So this is what this looks like. Uh, don't be scared. It's basically the same one as before from the random intercept with one additional random parameter, and then I've moved some things around, right? Um, so here now we have um, our overall intercept and our random intercept, right? So every J, every ego gets their own. Now I have the coefficient, the overall coefficient, and then I have a random coefficient. So now every ego network, every ego gets their own slope bump or slope deficit, depending on what's happening with that independent variable in their own network. Uh, and then I still have my error, right? Okay. So this is what this ends up looking like. Um, here is my overall regression line here. So that's my overall slope. Uh, I have my overall intercept. And so for Jane, here would, is where the parallel line would be before we were constraining that to be parallel. But now Jane gets a little bit of a slope bump here, right? So this is the standard slope that Seta outputs. And this is the slope that Jane has, um, which is the sort of standard slope plus her slope coefficient, her random coefficient, right? So she also has a random intercept. So now we're systematically taking account of all the ways that Jane differs from the normal or the overall sample averages, right? Because this is meaningful. It's not error. The reason that Jane is different is probably has to do with something about Jane, right? Or about Jane's particular constellation of alters. Um, and so now we're just adding another random parameter. So not super hard, right? So now what we see, if we were to uh, plot all of these regression lines, each of these are an ego, and each ego gets their own random intercept, right? If they didn't have their own random intercept, but they had their own random slope, what would it look like? This is a check. Check. Okay. Parallel. Not parallel. Yeah, they all start from the same place. And then it would be like, no, no, no. Right? And like all come out from there. Uh, exactly. Okay, perfect. So um, so here's Jane and here's Joe. So everyone gets their own regression line. The intercept is random. The slope is random. We allow it to vary, which is a better representation of the real world. And the overall intercept beta sub zero and the overall slope beta sub one right here are weighted averages of each ego's intercept and slope. Not weighted averages or not uh, a function of all the, the individual um, level one observations as it would be in OLS, right? So it's not necessarily the same intercept, intercept and slope that you would get if you use the alter observations to calculate it. Um, and if you care about what it's weighted by, uh, it gets more weight, right? So, so each person's uh, random variable gets more weight if the cluster is bigger and if there's less variation, right? So it's kind of like traditional weighting stuff, right? If you're providing more information and that information is more consistent, then we're going to give your random slope and random intercept a little bit more weight than somebody else's, okay? All right. So here is sort of a picture of piles of variance, right? What's happening with the random coefficient model? We're still just making piles of variance. We're not actually reducing any of the variance. We're not making it go away. 
We're just modeling it differently. So here's OLS. We throw everything in this error term, right? Even though we know there's dependency and it's not error. In a random intercept model, we're splitting it into the random intercept, which is a little better, right? It's more systematic. Uh, but then we still have a lot of, of error here, right, that we're just throwing away. In the random coefficient model, we still have our random intercepts, but now we're going to divide this residual variance up into a random slope or a random coefficient, which allows those lines to be different, and our residual variance error. So you can see that with each model, our residual variance is getting smaller. The amount that we're attributing to throw away error that we can't explain gets smaller, which is exactly what, what we want to do when we're building a model, right? Okay, so let's look at the random coefficient model in R. Suppose I want to know if the effective alter gender on support provision, we're staying with the same example, varies across egos, right? So, oh. Okay. So in other words, uh, one person's alter gender might matter more in a given network than in someone else's network. My, why might that be the case? And this could be a function of things that, we, that are measured or things that are unmeasured, right? What are some things that might affect whether I get more support from women in my network and you don't? Sure, the gender composition of the network as a whole, which, which is, we can measure. What else? Your gender? The gender identity of the ego. Yeah. Exactly, gender identity of the ego, perfect. We don't have those data, right? So it's unmeasured. Age what? of ego? Age of ego, sure, absolutely. Uh, I don't know. I'm not very creative today. <laughs> <laughs> but those are all viable examples, right? So the, the point is just that there are lots of measurable and unmeasurable ways uh, that might explain why the effects of something might differ across networks, right? So we can explicitly model this even if we don't know what's causing it, right? So that's sort of the point here, is that's what adding the random coefficient does. Um, okay, so your first step in the random coefficient model is to determine whether you need a random coefficient model, right? Um, so what I do is perform a nested LR test using stored estimates. And that allows me to determine whether the random slopes, which are just another parameter in my model, are dif different from zero. Are they adding anything to the model, right? So I run my random coefficient model. I've already run my random intercept model and stored the, the results of that. Hopefully that's right in the lab file. And then I just do an LR test using the ANOVA command. And that tells me whether adding uh, the, over here, the random intercept, right, which is right here, alter female, random equals alter female, whether adding that is improving the fit of my model. Um, and so this is the result. The p-value is 0.04. So what this tells me is that I can reject the null hypothesis that the random coefficients are equal to zero, which means that I need to use the random coefficient model. So if your p-value is less than 0.05, you should go ahead with the random coefficient. If it's not, <coughs> you can run the random intercept model because there is no systematic variation uh, in uh, the effects of that independent variable on your outcomes across egos, right? Okay, so this just sort of tells you from the start, do I need to do this? Okay, so then we run the random coefficient model, um, and you'll see that there are some more parameters of interest in here. So now we have the standard deviation of the random intercepts, which we had before. Now we have the standard deviation of the random slopes, right? And then we also have the standard deviation of the residuals, as we had before. So we have an extra parameter in here, and we're getting some information about how much variation there is. Um, and you can see that there's not a lot of variation in slopes, but obviously it's significant enough for this to contribute to model fit. So then I have the fixed part of the model, and I can interpret these exactly as I would have before, right? So um, ego gender still doesn't matter. Alter gender now is even bigger, right? So now that I've let the slopes vary, it has made this coefficient a little bit bigger, right? Because remember that coefficient is now 
based on allowing those slopes to differ and taking the average of the random um, coefficients rather than just the parallel slopes. Um, and my contextual effect looks about the same, right? One other interesting thing that's in here that can often be super cool is this, which is the correlation between the random slopes and the random intercepts. And this is what uh, REML adjusts for, right? So it's the idea, REML, basically if you don't put REML in, the model assumes that these are things are not going to be correlated, which they almost always are. But so what this means, it's positive, 0.13, right? So that means that for each ego, the higher their uh, dependent variable is, the higher their random intercept is, then the greater their slope is going to be, right? So if I'm someone who gets a lot of support, then I also tend to be someone for whom gender matters more, right? And so this often, a lot of people ignore this, but this is a super interesting value, right? You can think about like all the ways socially that that might be true, right? Um, yeah. So like an, an analogous would be like, let's say um, in the, the sexual contacts example, if you're somebody who has a lot of sex, maybe this is a negative correlation. Maybe communication matters less because you just have a really high libido and you're going to have sex with everything and it doesn't really matter how much you're talking to them, right? So you can also see a negative correlation, right? So this becomes really interesting in terms of testing theory and really understanding what's happening at the different levels. Okay, everybody understand what that is? Okay. Um, so again, I want to calculate the intraclass correlation here. And now I have different levels of variance. So I'm going to get the, the variance instead of just the standard deviation. So I use this vericore command to spit those out. And then I calculate the interclass correlation a little bit differently because now I have more, uh, I have another random parameter in here. So that needs to go into the overall level of variation, right, in my denominator. So that needs to be added here. So my interclass correlation now is about 0.05, which is still really low. So that's how you calculate that. Any questions about that? Yeah. How can you determine if variance correlation There is no significant or not. Um, so I don't know how to do this in R, but in Stata, um, because Stata is beautiful, the multi-level modeling output um, actually outputs at the bottom the LR test for whether you need the random intercepts or not, and that essentially tests this, whether that's a significant level of correlation or not. So I don't know what to tell you except use Stata. I do have Stata files for all of this. I have Stata output, Stata data sets. So if you are a Stata user and you are only using R because of this workshop, then I can send you those. Um, or if enough people want them, then I can send them for, uh, for the folder. But that's a good question, right? That's how you tell if it's significant or not. OK. Um, all right, I want to talk a little bit about cross-level interactions because this is where things get super cool. Right, this is where things get really fun. Um, so we can look at level one variables and level two variables and whether those interact. So that would be like alter or tie level stuff and network or ego level stuff. Those can interact to predict uh, a particular outcome. So usually it's how does the effect of some alter level variable vary as a function of what's happening at the ego level or at the network level, right? Or in other words, how does what's happening within this dyad uh, differ as a function of, of ego network characteristics or the network in which that tie is embedded, right? Um, and so this is not that different from regular interactions, except that you want to make sure you're using a random coefficient model, right? Why would you want to use a random coefficient model? Okay, I'll just tell you. You want to use a random coefficient model because in doing this interaction, you are explicitly theorizing that the effects should differ across levels, right? So the effects at the ego network level should differ. So we should allow those slopes to vary, right? And not constrain them to be equal. 
right? So if they vary systematically by something happening at level one, they should also be allowed to vary by other characteristics that are measured or unmeasured, right? Okay. All right, so you can run the uh, R file for the cross-level interaction. And uh, for this one, we're asking, suppose I want to know if the effect of alter gender differs for male and female egos, right? So this is essentially testing homophily, right? So whether that alter is a woman uh, might differ in terms of how much support she provides if I'm a woman versus if I'm a man, right? So there might be something about matching gender uh, that makes the support provision different, right? Okay, so I run the interaction effect. Um, so I'm adding that in up here. So I have my interactions. And the thing that you have to be careful about is you also have to add the interaction, uh, interaction for the contextual effect, right? Because it wouldn't really make sense if there was an interaction at one level but not at the other level. Right, so you have to allow um, basically the support provided as a function of ego's gender to vary as, as a function of the network as well as alter gender, right? So you always start by including both of those interactions, and then if it's not significant at the contextual effect level, you can just take out the interaction. Not the contextual effect, just the interaction, okay? So here I've run this model. Down here, I have my main effect of ego gender, my main effect of alter gender, um, my contextual effect, my interaction between ego and alter gender, and my interaction between ego gender and uh, network proportion female, right? So that's what this model should look like. Um, so I can interpret these. Does anyone want to try to interpret them, or do you want me to do it for you? Who feels brave? Nobody feels brave. Okay. Well, so this here, this main effect, is just the effect of ego being a woman when alter is also a woman, right? Or, sorry, a man, because it's gender, when alter is zero, right? So this is the effect of the alter being a woman when ego is a man, right? And then to get our interaction, we have to, let's see, these are not odds ratios, so we have to add them, right? So by looking at this here, which is highly positive, that tells us that there's a lot more support going on when both ego and alter are women, right? That's essentially what that um, interaction term is telling us, okay? There's nothing happening with this interaction, so in my final model, I would drop it and just footnote that I had done it, right? So it's much easier if we can conceptualize this with a figure, right? Interactions are always easier if you have something to visualize. And so this here is the predicted number of support resources provided by each alter um, as a function of ego uh, and alter gender. So the dotted line, oh, this is terrible. Is This is a one, so alter is a woman, and this is alter is a man. So basically, when ego is a man, which is right over here, there is no significant effect of an alter being a woman. It's basically the same, right? So both men and women provide the same amount of support to men. But when ego is a woman and the alter is a woman, there's a whole lot of supporting going on. But when ego is a woman and the alter is a man, there's very little support happening, right? So there's a very strong interaction, sort of similar with what we expected when we first brought this up, right? Okay, and that is a statistically significant interaction. Um, the interaction at level two is not significant, so again, I would just drop that. Okay, so that is all I have on multi-level modeling. I have a little series of slides on network dynamics and how to measure those and um, do all that. So I think I'll pause for a minute for questions about multi-level modeling, and then I think we actually will have time. You guys ask many less questions than they did last year, which maybe that means you understand it better. Um, and then we'll move on to ego network dynamics. So I want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions, either about MLM or anything else. If it was significant? Okay, let's interpret that. So she asked, what would it mean if the contextual effect was significant? 
right? So then we would interpret that the same way that we did the other. So let's, this is negative and a very small coefficient. But let's assume that it was larger and significant and meant something. So what this would tell us is uh, this is the effect of network proportion women when ego is a male, right? So, um, no, sorry. This is the effect of network proportion female when ego is a male. So to figure out what the effect would be when ego is a female, we would have to add those two things. And they're both negative. So what that would tell me is that ego being a female, uh, when ego is a female, the effect of having more women in the network is more negative, right? So the more women in, or that are in my network when I'm a woman, the less support I get, right? If I'm a man, I still get less support the more women I have in my network, but the effect is not as strong. Does that make sense? That's a good little exercise. Yeah. Women do a lot of comparison now with contact. Did you change the definition of your network? Say that again. Women do a lot of comparison in the network contacts. Do we need to change the definition of your network to No, but you can keep the same likelihood of it. Can you repeat the question? He asked whether you use the same estimation method across when you're comparing across models. I said yes. So, like, rem, like for example, Remel doesn't matter. Um, Remel doesn't change anything when it's only a random intercept model, but I leave it in anyway. I just always put it in. It's not going to change anything. Um, and then when I'm comparing across models, I'm using the same. Just always use Rumble. That's the lesson. No reason to not use it. Even when you have a binary outcome? Um, you know, I think you can use Rumble actually for binary outcomes. Okay. I don't remember actually offhand, but I think so. I don't know why you wouldn't be able to. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, well, let's talk about network dynamics. We have about 30 minutes left. Maybe there'll be time for questions, I'm not sure. Um, so ego network dynamics is like kind of my jam. Um, I'm really interested in this and interested in how to measure it appropriately. Um, and it's really interesting theoretically as well, thinking about the different mechanisms of dynamics. Uh, because ego networks are super dynamic. They change a lot, even over short periods of time. So thinking about why that is, is it due to external events? Is it due to internal changes in uh, dyads? Um, is it due to things that are happening in ego's life? Or is it due to measurement, right? All these things are super important uh, to keep in mind when you, when you want to measure dynamics. So I'll start with the sort of what are the basic things that we know about ego network change? Um, to provide just kind of a baseline level of knowledge that we're starting from. So in general, the structural properties of networks, so how big it is, how dense it is, even things like composition, tend to remain pretty stable over time. But there's a lot of what I would call network turnover, or what Dan Halgen and Steve Borgatti call tie churn, um, in the individuals that make up the network, right? So the membership, the actual people changes a lot. So what this means is that if you're only measuring things at the aggregate level, you might come to the conclusion that things aren't changing very much. But really, underneath the surface, you've got lots of people, lots of alters, specific alters coming and going, right? Um, so for example, in, the, uh, in Wellman's study of East York uh, in Ontario, only 27% of ties persisted over a decade. Right? So if you think about you know, the 12 most important people in your life or 15 most important people, only 27% of them uh, will still be important to you uh, in 10 years. That's really sad. Um, but it's not always sad, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean that your lost ties, uh, lost ties doesn't mean networks are getting smaller, right? There's a lot of replacement uh, into your network. So that's important to keep in mind when we're thinking about how to measure it. Um, networks are comprised of two basic components, right? So this is sort of how we think about how networks are structured. So there's typically a smaller and more stable core, 
network, so you'll often hear the term core network in ego network research. Um, and these tend to be pretty densely knit, um, mostly kin and highly supportive, high frequency of contact, uh, long in duration, right? So these are, you know, if I asked you who is your core network, you could probably name three to five people pretty quickly, right, that are sort of the people that are always there. Um, and then this sort of core is surrounded by a larger set of temporary or more sporadic uh, set of ties, which we call the periphery. And so in terms of membership turnover, we see most of the action in this periphery, right? So most people have a core that's not going anywhere. This has a really important implications for measuring network change, right? Because if you set up your name generators such that you're only getting the smaller and more stable core, you're going to come to the conclusion that networks don't change very much, right? Um, so the sort of action in terms of measuring dynamics tends to be in the periphery. So you want to use strategies for eliciting a broader set of weaker ties. So the periphery turns out to be a pretty big problem for cross-sectional network, network studies, right? Because the people that we name in the periphery varies a lot depending what's happening in our lives. So if you're only getting someone at one point in time, uh, what's called a snapshot, um, then sometimes the people that can end up in that network, right, is essentially random. So it can, you know, like let's say that you're looking for a job. The people that you've been talking to lately and the people that are going to come to mind um, are maybe people that helped you with that job search, right? But if something different was going on in your life, um, then you might name a different set of people. Uh, or maybe it's close to Christmas, and so you just saw those wacky cousins that you haven't seen forever. So, you know, they're, they're salient and top of mind, so you mention them, right? Um, so what we find is that these people engage in sort of periods of brief and sporadic contact, meaningful contact with people, old friends, uh, weak tie provides some important information, and that this affects who is named in these studies, right? So if you're only getting one uh, snapshot or one cross-sectional um, sort of burst of information, um, it's really hard to know who those people really are or how meaningful they really are. When peripheral ties are not captured, this is another problem, they're assumed to be absent rather than inactive, which is not necessarily true, right? So we found, for example, in our research on mental illness that when someone is first diagnosed or when there's a crisis, the network gets really big, right? They name a lot of people as, you know, uh, helping them out or talking to them about their health or mental illness. And then a year later, the network looks much smaller. Well, if you didn't understand the context, then you could come to the conclusion that people had rejected them as a function of their mental illness, right? Because of stigma or uh, caregiver burden. But in fact, it's just that those people aren't as needed anymore. And that it's not that the relationship is not there. The relationship didn't end, right? It's just latent. They don't use them as much. They don't need to talk to them as much because the crisis uh, has been resolved, right? So understanding the reason for dynamics is super important. Um, and all that is to say that instability doesn't necessarily mean real change. Right? It might just be, mean a change in the level of activity rather than an end or a new relationship. Okay, so all of these things that we know about network change pose real problems for how to measure it, right? So the first problem is trying to understand whether we have real change or whether that change is some kind of methodological artifact. So one of the things that we know, for example, is that respondents forget to name alters from previous waves about 5 to 10% of the time, right? So it's just a matter of that person not remembering to mention someone. So if we don't have a way of following up and asking them about people from ties from previous waves, then we might assume that, well, we don't know what happened to that relationship, right? Maybe it ended, uh, maybe they're not talking to that person anymore, but they're still friends or whatever, right? So we have to wait to account for some of these methodological problems. Um, we also know that uh, respondents deliberately underreport alters in subsequent waves because they know that every alter they mention is going to mean more work for them, right? So you see pretty strong panel conditioning effects in uh, network, um, network research. Um, and then another sort of more practical problem is that respondents 
sometimes give different names or different spellings in subsequent waves. And this is particularly true for more peripheral ties, right? So people they're not related to, but maybe someone that you've drugs with or had sex with or whatever. Okay, the second problem is that it's super important to, to understand what kinds of alter level changes underlie network level change, right? And this gets back to this issue of there can be a lot of sort of movement going on under the surface in terms of membership, but the structural characteristics might look the same, right? So suppose, for example, that the mean frequency of contact with network members decreases from wave one to wave two, right? So I just see a net decrease. I've aggregated across alters, and they're talking less um, or having less frequent co contact um, in wave two compared to wave one. This can be due to a number of different mechanisms, right? So one mechanism is that ego is decreasing contact with alters who were present at both waves, right? So this is sort of how we might um, initially interpret it, which is that, oh, I'm withdrawing, I'm not seeing people as much, right? But the, still the same people are there. Another possibility is that I've lost alters who I used to have really frequent contact with, and so that brought the mean down, right? That's a very different sort of social uh, event than just not talking to people who are still around, right? If I've lost a very significant tie, that can have a very different impact on health. Um, or it could be that I've added new alters, right? Everybody that I talked to before, I'm still having the same frequency of contact with them, but maybe I moved, right, or changed jobs, and now I have all these new people in my network, and I don't see them as often or talk to them as often, so they're bringing down my mean, but that's probably a net positive. Right? I'm gaining network members, uh, weaker ties who might eventually become strong ties. Right? So understanding what's really happening underneath is super, super important for identifying the social mechanism or the social engine of action that's at work. Okay, so there's a solution to this. It would be pretty shitty if I was like, oh, look at all these problems, and then I was like, okay, have fun. <laughs> You're on your own. Um, so there, there is a solution. So in each follow-up wave of the study, uh, you need to do a few things, right? So first, I would have egos name their current alters, just as they normally would if I wasn't trying to account for change, right? So let's say this is wave two. They've already named their alters. Now it's wave two, and I'm like, okay, who do you talk to about important matters or whatever? The second step, after they've already named them, is to show them their roster from the previous wave or waves, depending how far you want to go back. And then you can have them deliberately match alters across waves. So this gets rid of the problem of, did I spell this name differently, right? So let's say that, um, I don't know, uh, Sophia ends up in both waves one and wave two, wave two, but it's spelled differently. If you're showing them those networks, they can make that connection that it's actually the same Sophia without you having to try to guess. Um, and then you can also ask them why they didn't name any alters from the previous wave that were dropped, right? So we literally will explicitly say, uh, so here's what this looks like. This is the wave one roster and the wave two roster. So first, we ask them to make sure that this is the same Rob, right? And we make that explicit connection in the data so we don't have to do that messiness later. Um, and then I'm going to ask them about the people here that they named that they didn't name. So why didn't you mention Ava, right? And then you record that data because we've actually written papers on that data. Like it's super interesting to know why ties are dropped. So another interesting thing is that if you ask them why didn't you mention Ava, they're much less, less likely to, um, to drop the altar because they don't want to do the work because they actually have to make up a reason why they didn't um, why they didn't include that person. And that ends up being like cognitively kind of difficult for anyone who's not a sociopath, right? <laughs> um, I mean, you can't be like, oh, I didn't name Ava because she died, right? Or because, you know, I mean, people just don't do it. They'll just add them, right? This is what we found over and over again. Um, or if they've dropped them, sometimes it's for an interesting and meaningful reason. And then you can just make a quick note about that. And then that becomes data as well, right? That's interesting for whatever you're theorizing. Okay, so that's how you do it. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the uh, most common and useful measures of network change. 
Uh, so you can capture network turnover pretty easily by distinguishing between uh, the proportion of alters that were dropped from one wave to another, uh, the proportion or number of alters that were added, and then the proportion of stable alters, right? Obviously, you can't put all these in in the same model, not all the, um, the proportions you can, but uh, the ends are going to be correlated, right? So you have to be careful about that. But there are these different ways to capture turnover. Um, the way that we conceptualize it so that you can add all this information into one nice measure is um, a network turnover um, a network turnover measure from, I don't even remember where we published this, but anyway, you can find it. Um, and so this is sort of an illustration of what this looks like. It's the number of dropped or added, right, so ties that are different as a function of number of unique alters in the house two ties. Yes? I have a question. So if you are interested in a particular, it's not really the alter, but the alter's role, like, and the turnover within that role, yeah. how would you isolate that change from the overall, like, network change? So any of these measures that I'm talking about, you can compute on a sub-network. Right, so if you're interested in turnover among friends, for example, which might be more interesting than turnover among family, because we tend to keep our family when we want to or not, right? You could isolate the friends and then say proportion of friends added or proportion of friends dropped, right? Okay. So any of this can be done on sort of sub sections of the network. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so the way you do this, so these are the people that were named at wave one and wave two. Um, you can see that three of the ties are the same or stable ties, and then you have three ties that were dropped and three ties that were added. So we pool these together into uh, one sort of network across the two, and so we end up then with six ties that were either dropped or added and three stable ties. So this gives you 67% network turnover, right, which is a pretty high level of turnover. So that's one way that you can measure just sort of the overall instability or tie churn uh, in the network. Um, how to analyze network change? So it depends, again, on what your goal is. So if your goal is to describe change, you can just do a comparison of ego network characteristics over time. So you could do average degree or network size at wave one compared to average network size at degree two. Uh, you could also measure the difference between two waves, right, which would be like network growth or network shrinkage, um, and that's fine. Um, you can distinguish between the number of alters or proportion of alters that were dropped or were stable or were added across waves. So you can present the number or percentage of each. So you could say that this ego dropped 35% of alters between wave one and wave two. And that can be a dependent or an independent variable for predicting stuff that's happening at wave two. Um, you can compare the characteristics of each. So 75% of maintained alters are very close, right? So you can look at the ones that are maintained versus ones that are dropped and say, okay, what characteristics predict who's dropped, who's added, or who sticks around, right, at wave two. So there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do, uh, do with this. If the goal is to predict network change or to use network change to predict outcomes, you want to use longitudinal multilevel models, which I don't have time to go into in this short format. Um, but it's just, again, it's another extension of the network of the multilevel models that we already talked about. So now you have observations over time nested in egos, right? So this is where, if you're one of those people who's like, I will never use an alter level variable ever as a dependent variable, but I do have longitudinal data, then everything that I just taught you about MLM is relevant, right? Because you can measure um, ego networks over time, right, for example, um, or nested within organizations or whatever. Um, so this requires a special class of multilevel models called growth models. And for these, you're explicitly measuring the effects of time and then putting interactions for time times predictors, right? So does the effect of this thing grow over time or does the effect of this thing uh, decline over time, right? So they're growth models. Uh, and there are some other things that you have to pay a little bit more attention to when it's longitudinal, uh, but the sort of root conceptual stuff is the same as what I taught you before, 
right? So if we were in a long format uh, workshop right now, I would teach you how to do these and teach you how to do three level models. Um, any citations? Yeah, um, so I really like uh, Lisa Hoffman's book on measuring, I think it's called Measuring Within and Between Person Change or something like that. Um, so she really advocates a variance decomposition strategy, which is what I use for all my multi-level models pretty much. Um, huh? Variance decomposition models. So for those, you're explicitly, this is basically the alternative to a contextual effect, but it doesn't really make sense when you're talking about networks. When you're talking about longitudinal models, it makes total sense because you're just explicitly uh, breaking up the within and between variation. So you get all of the benefits of using a fixed effects model, but you can also model uh, the effects of level two variables. Beautiful. Um, so essentially you have a variable that is, uh, how am I different from myself over time? And then how am I different from other people on average? You're just explicitly splitting that variation up into two variables. Really easy to do, um, and she describes it really well, I think. Um, I, not to pimp my own book, but I also talk about all these things in the context of uh, ego networks and ego network change. So if you want sort of a more in-depth dive on this and everything else I've talked about, then you could pick that up if you want. I swear I don't get very much commission, like two cents or something. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, I also teach workshops, like week, like a week-long version of this, um, which includes um, time for one-on-one -on -one sort of interactions around your own project. Like, why am, am I forgetting the word for that? Yes, thank you. Consultation. <laughs> um, with me or uh, one of my students who knows this stuff as well as I do. Um, and so it's nice to be able to build that in. So I teach those at Lynx often, which is the one in Kentucky. It's Borgatti's thing. A couple of you have been to that before. And then I'm also teaching it in mid-July at IU. Um, but we don't have the registration up yet. So if you're interested, just email me. And that's all I have for you. I actually ended early. It was kind of a miracle. <laughs>